Hey everybody. Hey, welcome. I am here with my sweet friend, Michelle, and we are so excited to talk to you about women's health and the pelvic floor. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and making time to spend some time with us. And it looks like we are working well on Facebook. So this is so good. We like to make sure that our tech is working. We have people coming on over on Facebook Live and over on Zoom. So welcome so much, everybody. And we're going to jump into the class. And I know Michelle wanted to kind of kick us off and share a little bit of info with us, which I'm so excited to hear. So Michelle, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so generous. Well, I just wanted to uh, welcome everybody and say thank you so much for joining us. And I just want to introduce our special speaker, <laughs> Laura. She's super humble, but really, honestly, she's an expert, and I'm really happy that she's here and has time to speak with us. Um, Dr. Laura Ritchie is a National Certified Women's Health and Nutrition Coach. She also has a Doctor of Physical Therapy with a specialty in women's health issues and specifically pelvic floor. She's also a wellness advocate and a global leader with doTERRA. And I met Dr. Laura through the Chronic Lyme Summit a couple years years ago and just through her honest sharing about pelvic floor, about Lyme, about cancer, about hip dysplasia, <laughs> all the things. And she just, you know, shared so authentically and I felt comfortable reaching out and we've been kind of virtual friends, if you will, ever since. So um, that's how we connected. And I wanted just to give you a little bit of a preview of what we're going to talk about tonight. It's going to be less than an hour class, but we'll be here for Q&A. So for those of you who need to hop off, no problem. And for those of you who want to stick around and ask questions, we're here for you. So in our class, we're going to cover some statistics on pelvic floor challenges and learn a little bit about how prevalent these challenges are, what the pelvic floor is, proper toileting techniques. Yes, I said toileting on Instagram and now probably Facebook. <laughs> Um, mirroring work, um, learning how to do proper contractions and Kegels, and um, learning about bladder irritants and nutrition and essential oils for support for bladder and pelvic floor. So, and last but not least, also how to find a pelvic floor physical therapist. So I'm going to turn this over because I have two little ones I'm going to take care of. Take it away. Thanks so much, Michelle. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you guys are all here. This is going to be such a fun packed class. And I wanted to start off with just talking about what the pelvic floor is, because a lot of people have questions about this. And the pelvic floor really is, it's a network of ligaments and muscles and connective tissue. And this is, we're going to bring out Bertha. And Bertha is my favorite. I love to bring out Bertha in this. And the pelvic floor actually acts as a hammock to support the pelvic floor organs, including the bladder and the rectum and in women uterus and vagina. And I think we forget that men have pelvic floor muscles too. This is very important. So if we flip Bertha around here, we've got superficial muscles that make up part of the pelvic floor. And then on the inside, we have the deeper muscles. So as you guys can see, it really does look like a bowl. And we've got our organs that go inside of our pelvis here. And the pelvic floor does a lot of work to hold up all of these organs up against gravity and support us. And we can have weakened pelvic floor muscles where the internal organs are not fully supported. And then you may have difficulty controlling the release of urine or having a bowel movement or issues with passing gas. So when we're talking about any urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, any issues where we have a prolapse maybe of the uterus or when we have issues going on where the bladder is starting to protrude through a cystocele or a rectocele where the rectum is starting to come through. So this is really, really important because common causes of weak pelvic floor could be childbirth. That's a big trauma <laughs> when we think about it on the pelvic floor that's happening here. There can be maybe chronic constipation or issues like that that can affect our pelvic floor too because if you think about it, we have a lot of systems that are happening in a very small area and space. We've got the urinary system, we've got our digestive system and our digestive tract where all of that is entering out and exiting out. We've got you know the area that the OBG, OBGYN kind of covers with our uterus and the vagina and our ovaries and all of that. And there's a lot happening in this teeny tiny area and space. And then sometimes we can get overactive muscles 
where we have a pelvic floor dysfunction. So these are all really important things to consider. And I think, Michelle, did you have some stats that you wanted to share with us? Oh, I'm sorry, Michelle, I think we're muted. Let me unmute you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I have read, there's a range, but as much as 15% um, of women report pelvic floor challenges. So that's a pretty significant um, segment of our population. And there are other really interesting connections between abuse, um, even sexual abuse, and also um, when folks, ladies in particular, treat these pelvic floor issues, they also report um, um, decreased feelings of depression and decreased feelings of anxiety. So a very interesting thing that I didn't know. Um, there's some interesting connections and mood and body and all of that together and past you know, experiences. So I found that very interesting. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Michelle. I really appreciate it. And we are going to dive in. We're going to talk about a lot of things. There's so much to cover really that I want to share with you. So I'm going to keep it to basic simple principles with the pelvic floor, but also things that you guys can start to utilize in your everyday life. And Michelle, chime in if I'm missing anything or if you wanna add anything to this too. But one major thing that we have to talk about is proper toileting techniques. This is a really, really important thing when talking about the pelvic floor. And unfortunately, a lot of people will hover. So I want to hear from you guys. Put up a one in the comments if you don't sit on a toilet in a public restroom. Are you a hoverer? Do you hover over the toilet? Do you not like to sit on the toilet when maybe you're going to the bathroom in a public restroom? Let me know. Okay, ones are coming up. This is a very common thing, actually. A lot of people will do this, and we're going to talk about why it's really important to sit down on the toilet seat when you're going to the bathroom because the muscles have to relax when we're going to the bathroom. And if we're hovering or we're squatting over the toilet, we're actually, it's kind of counterproductive and we're not able to fully relax the muscles of the pelvic floor. So I want you guys, and if you're a little concerned, you can put those paper covers over the toilet or maybe grab your on guard hand sanitizer spray or something and wipe it down. But I promise you there's actually more germs on those doorknobs than there are on your toilet seat. But step one, make sure that you fully sit down on the toilet. This is good for your overall pelvic floor health long term. So you got to trust me on this. So that's really important. And then also you want to make sure that you're avoiding distractions like reading or being on your cell phone or things when you're going to the bathroom. You want to let those muscles. So let's grab Bertha again. These muscles of the pelvic floor, you want to let them sink down and visualize them actually feeling heavy and warm. You do not want to push or strain when going to the bathroom. That could be an issue. And oftentimes when people are straining or pushing, it's because they've got a constipation issue. And then the other thing going on is when you're pushing or straining, you're holding your breath. Oftentimes people can Valsalva and they hold their breath and they try to bear down and it just doesn't work as well. And it's not very optimal. Well, you're going to put a lot of pressure down through your pelvic floor. So try using a small step stool or a few books to actually elevate your knees over your hips when you're voiding and see if that helps you to completely empty your bladder or your bowels. Cause there's a lot of people that will say, it feels like I can't completely empty my bladder when I go to the bathroom. And one of my favorite things that I really love is a fun stool called the squatty potty we're just letting it all loose tonight ladies we're gonna talk about it all and it's really nice because it slides under your toilet and you can pull it out when you go to the bathroom you can get these at target you can get them on amazon you can get them all over but the squatty potty is amazing we all need squatty potties boys need squatty potties too and you put it down and we're going to go through this together, ladies. So, or you can get your books, right? You can get a bunch of books and people think you're really smart and you're studying in the bathroom when you're going to the bathroom. But these are really important things that we've got to talk about. So this is going to actually allow you, let's see if you guys can even see me here in this seated position. Can you guys see my knees a little bit? We're going all out. So I'm, I have 
my legs up on the squatty potty. And so when you're going to the bathroom, you can use that, prop them up on the books, or I love the squatty potty, kind of rest your arms forward a little bit. And what this does is it allows you to get in a better position to completely relax your pelvic floor and completely empty your bowels by improving that anorectal angle. So the angle that's kind of happening here in our organs and helping us to be able to fully evacuate when we need to. So you can bend forward a little bit. You can kind of put your arms up. We're going to be relaxed. We're going to take a couple nice slow deep breaths. We're not going to be multitasking, right? This is ideal. I know that you guys are busy mamas and maybe this doesn't always work for you, but ideally letting those muscles feel heavy, sinking down into the pelvic floor and relaxing that when you're going to the bathroom and not pushing or straining or forcing urine out or when you're trying to have a bowel movement. This is really, really important. We don't learn this in school, right? <laughs> but we should because it's very, very important for your overall health and your pelvic floor health. So that is the squatty potty. That's my first tip for you. Get that or some books or something. Lean forward. Make sure that you're not pushing or straining. Especially, it's interesting to me that teachers and nurses actually have the highest rates of urinary incontinence because they can't go to the bathroom all the time that they need to, right? They have to wait for a break or when they have something there and then they're running to the bathroom and then they're pushing and straining and trying to do it as quickly as possible. So ideally we want to start tuning in, listening to our body when we're thirsty, drinking water, when we need to go to the bathroom, honoring that as much as possible. The next thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about is near work to learn how to do a correct contraction because there's a lot of people out there, right? We hear of kegels and we hear, you know, tightening up those muscles, but believe it or not, a lot of people are not drawing up and in with the pelvic floor. They're actually like bearing down or pressing down. So this is something, and this class is just going to be basic education with this, but get a handheld mirror. I think it's really important to check out your pelvic floor and look at that. How are we going to know if we have issues going on, if we don't know what our normal looks like and getting used to that. And I know this can be a tough thing for women, especially, but it's really important. You know, guys have no problems with this. Like <laughs> they'll check themselves out. We should too. And, and know what your anatomy looks like. This is really, really important. You know, know, your anatomy, know where your clitoris is know where the vaginal opening is. All of this stuff is really important. And this is your body. So educate yourself, get a mirror, really, really important. And then let those muscles, again, you're working on this, let those muscles sink down, visualizing them feeling heavy or warm. Don't push or strain as we, you know, as we talked about, but kind of see what's going on with those, see what it feels like to be relaxed. And then just take a look when you do a Kegel, you should pull up and in and the pelvic floor should actually kind of start to close off. It should come up and in and you should see a closing off of the vaginal and anal openings when you're tightening up. When you're bulging, when you're pressing down, it should be like having a bowel movement. And that's actually going to kind of open a little bit more. So you can practice with this. You can get a little Q-tip or a tampon and put that in that opening and see when you do a Kegel, are you pulling up and in? Is it going up and in? Or are you bulging? And is it going out? And notice what those things are feeling like because it's important to know how to do a proper contraction when you're doing a Kegel and pulling up and in. It's also important to know how to relax to come back to that baseline and then a bulge where you're bearing down. So, so three things there, contraction, relax, bulge down and see what happens to your vaginal and anal areas when you do these exercises with a mirror. And then again, we talked about, you can try inserting a tampon or a Q-tip or doing a Kegel. And if you're doing the Kegel, you should pull that tampon or Q-tip up and in and a bulge should start to push that out and notice throughout the day, what's going on with your pelvic floor. Okay. Because a lot of us, whether we realize it or not, we're tightening up or tensing a lot. It's interesting what goes into the pelvic floor, because this is a protective response. If we feel threatened or unsafe, we're going to close all that off. Right. And, and that's kind of getting into that fight or flight. So noticing throughout the day, go, huh, is my pelvic floor tight? Am I contracted? Am I relaxed? If you're not sure you did your mirror exercise to kind of help you. So you could practice, you could do uh, Kegel pulling up and in. So that's going to be drawing up and in as if you were going to stop the flow of urine. 
you can try that every once in a while to just kind of test the muscles of the pelvic floor. That's not something you should do every time you go to the bathroom, like pee and stop and pee and stop. We don't want to do that. But maybe every once in a blue moon, maybe once a month, you check in and you see if you can stop that flow of urine and go on. But that's just what I want you to visualize or visualize closing off those vaginal and anal openings when you're doing that. So that drawing up and in. And some people do better with visualization. If you think of a flower bud and it's tightening up and closing, and then when you're relaxing, that's opening up. So whatever kind of visual cue works for you, that's really important. I think it's really important to know how to do a Kegel correctly because a lot of women are bearing down and bulging and they're not actually contracting and getting that pull up and in like they should. So that's something to just practice. And that's why I think it's really important to get to know your body, get a hand mirror out, start to practice this. Another tip that you can do is we call this the knack. So a lot of times women may have issues with any type of increased intra-abdominal pressure. So coughing, sneezing, laughing, jumping, anything like that that's putting more of that pressure right down through the pelvic floor, they may have more leakage. So what you can do once you feel confident and comfortable doing a Kegel correctly, you can actually start to practice by doing a Kegel and also drawing in and tightening your transverse abdominis muscle. So the way that you're going to do this is you're going to draw in just a little bit. It's not a big, it's not that. It's not like completely pulling in your abdominal muscles, but it's, it's just enough to where if you were trying to zip up a tight pair of jeans, just that little drawing in that you do with your abdomen with your transverse abdominis to kind of pull that up and in and get that transverse abdominis to contract a little bit and draw those things in together and then cough. So say if you, if you feel a cough coming on, you can, yep, perfect. Do that Kegel, pull up and in and then, and start to practice that where we're testing the pelvic floor with that increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Another thing you can do, you can actually find your transverse abdominis if you feel for your hip bones, your pelvic bones on either side, that bony prominence, and you come a little bit in and a little bit down. And when you draw in, you'll feel it's very subtle, but you'll feel a little muscle kind of pop up into your two fingers. And you can practice that when drawing in and kind of feel it tighten up and see and work on that. This is, I've had abdominal surgery for a sarcoma. So this is an area that I've been doing a lot of work is to retrain that transverse abdominis to kick in and work because it's all related. We have the back extensors, the multifidi in the back. We've got the transverse abdominis in the front. We have the diaphragm here at the top. And then at the bottom, we have our pelvic floor. And these things are all working together. So we want to work with the core. We want to work with the pelvic floor with that. But you can try that. It's called the knack. If you know that you're going to cough or sneeze and start to do that as a preventative of tighten up a little bit, tighten, do that Kegel do that transverse abdominis contraction, and then cough or sneeze or have that on hand. And that can be a really nice one to do. Okay, with pelvic floor strengthening, I will say this, and I have a caution for this, and this is why I really think it's important. We're providing education for you guys tonight. But I really think it's important that you listen to your body and know that if you start strengthening and anything gets worse, okay, say you start to do some kegels and some strengthening and maybe you have pelvic pain and your pelvic pain gets worse or the urinary incontinence gets worse or fecal incontinence or any of those things get worse. If anything gets worse with a strengthening program, please stop your exercises right away and please go and see a pelvic floor physical therapist. Okay, this is very, very important because I think there's a lot of people out there that will say, oh, just strengthen, just do a bunch of kegels and that will fix your problems. And for some people, it actually makes it worse because if you have a spasm, these are muscles, right? Muscles and ligaments and connective tissue and the muscles of the pelvic floor and you have a spasm in your muscle. Like say, for example, you have a, a, a trigger point or a spasm in your neck or in your shoulder. When you try to strengthen a spasm, it can actually make the spasm worse. So this is where if anything gets worse, you stop, right? And that's telling me that there are probably some trigger points, some tight points in those pelvic floor muscles. Just like if we had a knot in our neck or in our shoulder, we would work those, right? Same thing with this. So this is where you would need to see a pelvic floor PT to do a full evaluation and examination on you. And they actually can do internally through 
the vaginal canal, you can actually palpate the muscles of the pelvic floor. So palpating through here, the superficial muscles and the deeper muscles, and they can tell if there are trigger points or issues going on and address those and work on those for you. So oftentimes we need to address the trigger points first, then we can go back through and work on the strengthening. And the muscles of the pelvic floor should be soft. You know, they should be, we should be able to palpate those. We should be able to feel a good pulse. There should be blood flow going through the pelvic floor. And if anything feels really hard, like a rock, or tight or is causing pain, that's going to be a pelvic floor dysfunction type issue. And that's where you really need to work with your pelvic floor physical therapist to address this. And this is a specialty, okay? Not every physical therapist is trained in pelvic floor and assessing this. And this is why we'll share some links at the end and I'll post them in this video too so that you have that so that you can go and you can get evaluated and assess. They're gonna check your alignment, they're gonna check your pelvis and your sacrum and check the muscles of the pelvic floor and really work with you for your goals. So if you're having low back pain that isn't going away with traditional orthopedic treatment or hip pain or pelvic pain, pain with intercourse, pain with tampons, pain with pelvic exams, sacroiliac SI joint pain, if you're having urinary incontinence or leakage or fecal incontinence, or you feel like something's falling out, this feeling of like things are falling out, or you feel like you can't completely empty your bladder or your bowels when you go to the bathroom, these are all red flags that you need to have an evaluation by a pelvic floor physical therapist and a specialist not just a regular PT, but really kind of dive deeper into this. These are not normal things. Well, we hear about them often. They could be common, but that's not a normal issue. We need to work on that and we can get you feeling really better. And pelvic floor PTs are magic, right? <laughs> like our patients so appreciate it because it's a very sensitive part of the body, right? This isn't something that you talk about around dinner parties. Like if you hurt your shoulder, you'd be like, oh, hey, I you know, hurt my shoulder playing racquetball or whatever. But this is a little bit different. So I just want to say that. Now, with the pelvic floor, we have fast twitch muscles and slow twitch muscles. So we can strengthen in different ways to kind of support that. And by that, I mean you can do long holds where you actually do a Kegel. You can test that and you can pull up and in and you can hold for a full 10 seconds. And maybe you start with five second holds. And then you work your way up gradually to 10 second holds. And these are your endurance muscles, right? This is when, hey, I've got to go to the bathroom and I can't get there just right away. So I'm going to recruit those endurance muscles to help us to get to the bathroom when I need to, when I need to go to the bathroom. So we need to train in that way. But also quick flicks. So again, we're working both types of muscle, fast twitch and slow twitch. And the quick flicks are going to be like that increase in intra-abdominal pressure, that cough, that sneeze, that laugh that we need to quick draw in and support us when we need to. So you could do a little bit of both with the strengthening where you do quick second holds, where you drop and hold for a second or two and relax and make sure you're relaxing completely. The relax is just as important as the contraction piece. So you can work on the, on the long holds. We can do it together where you draw up and in and you hold for 10 seconds while breathing and drawing in and then you can relax and work on those. And you could just start, maybe you start with working on maybe two sets of 10 and gradually work from there. And then you could work on the quick flicks too. Typically, I would recommend people start doing this laying down in their bed where we're minimizing gravity because if you're sitting or standing, you're working against gravity. Your pelvic floor is having to work even harder. So starting laying down where we have gravity to help us and we can work on or on your side, laying on your side, and you can have gravity to help you a little bit and then you can progress. As that gets easier and easier, you can progress to sitting, progress to standing in those different positions. But I also want you to check in with your pelvic floor about once an hour to make sure that that is fully relaxed. Are you like, am I relaxing? If you're just standing, you should be able to relax your pelvic floor. Now in motion, moving, we want that pelvic floor kicking in and supporting us um, in that way. So again, you can try that. That's some very basic pelvic floor strengthening. Start with a little bit, work your way up. If anything gets worse, stop stop <laughs> and go and see a pelvic floor PT. And you may need to specially request that by your OBGYN or your doctor. In some states, we have direct access, which means that you can go and you can get a script 
to see a pelvic floor PT and have that on hand. But like here in the state of Texas, we actually don't have that yet. So you actually need a prescription from your doctor to see a physical therapist to help you with that. Okay, sitting recommendations for pelvic floor. Ideally, ladies, and I know this isn't very ladylike, but I'm going to say it anyways, we are going to work on ideally symmetry where you're not crossing your legs and you're making sure that your feet are fully supported on the ground and that you relax your legs as much as you can and that you're not tightening up your pelvic floor and, and holding onto that all the time. Because if you think about it, if we were, if I was to hold this fist, and maybe I could do it for a couple minutes, but after a while, it's going to get painful, <laughs> right? And then after, if I keep doing this for several days, it might get hard to fully lengthen out those muscles. And that's kind of the same thing that's going on with the pelvic floor. So just notice if you're always holding tension there, if you're really tight in that area and see if you can relax, see if you can breathe through, again, because of that di a diaphragmatic breath, breathing through to the pelvic floor. These are all really good just hygiene tips, just things to be aware of, right? Just like with our proper toileting techniques, just with looking with the mirror and being able to know, hey, am I contracting correctly or not? Just little tips for you here. Michelle, anything that you want to add? <laughs> just, I am learning so much. This is very informative, very informative. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm just blowing my mind. This is all good. <laughs> this, is so much fun. this is this is so much fun to see oh we've got a bunch of people popping on so good to see you guys and then megan says i'm speaking her pt language oh and <laughs> megan, annette says that this is a good review this will be so good yes annette is one of my sweet pelvic floor pt friends in california i love it so much we got a lot of pts on holler yeah if you're a pt let me know type PT in there. I love to kind of meet my other clinicians and um, healthcare professionals, all that. This is good stuff. Okay. So let's talk about bladder irritants. Yes, Lindsay. Hello. <laughs> it's good to see you guys. Lots of PTs um, and PTAs and people in the healthcare field. So good. Okay, we're gonna talk about bladder irritants now. So there are some, oh, Lindsay, Lindsay's an aspiring women's health PT. Yes, and Crystal, we need more women's health and pelvic floor PTs, guys. We really do, there's not a lot. So know that there may be a waiting list. For a lot of pelvic floor PTs, there may be a three to six month wait list because it's a rare specialty, so we need more. So I'm so excited, Lindsay, to hear that you are diving deeper into this. Oh, Andrea is a pelvic floor PT in Arkansas. This is so awesome. Yes, I love it. So very good stuff here. Okay, bladder irritants. There can be some things that irritate the lining of your bladder. These can be things like coffee or alcohol or citrus or chocolate or carbonated beverages like the Cokes and the soda. So ideally, especially if we've got an issue, you know, like a urinary incontinence issue or leakage, anything like that, you may want to work on slowly eliminating those dietary irritants. Now, everybody's different. We get to choose, right? We get to choose. So Crystal says she's going to a course in January. This is so cool. Hi, Cassandra. Yes, Women's Health PT in Ohio. This is so awesome. So no, I will tell you an example. So one of my patients, when I was in the clinic, she loved Diet Dr. Pepper. Like she just, that was her jam. And she, she just flat out told me, I am not giving up the diet soda. And I was like, okay, <laughs> so we're going to have to work with this. I have some patients who would tell me that I'm not giving up coffee. It's like, okay, so we come to a happy medium, right? This is where you get to make those choices. And it was interesting with her. She progressed really well and did great in physical therapy. You know, we did some internal work. We released the spasms. We started strengthening and she did great. We actually got her to a place where she was not having any urinary incontinence or leakage issues unless she had a diet Dr. Pepper, unless she had a diet soda, and then she knew it was going to happen. So she was also in an empowered place to be like, okay, I know if I'm going to have this, that I'm going to have an issue with that. So something to think about because these can irritate the lining of the bladder. Do you guys like that I have a little bladder? It makes my heart happy. You can even open it up. Like the nerd in me just loves little models. I got this model on Amazon and it came with all the organs and I really like it. Um, but those could be a bladder irritant. So know that if you're a heavy coffee drinker, and coffee is actually one of those that's kind of hard on the leaky, on leaky gut too. It's very acidic. You know, there's, there's some issues there. But if you're just not going to give up your coffee, make sure that you have water with it. 
do some coffee, do some <laughs> <my> water, <laughs> do some <laughs> coffee, do some water, you know, do those together so that you're diluting that down a little bit. Okay. Gradually work on decreasing the amount of coffee or the soda that you have. Okay. Make sure that you're drinking water with that to decrease the acidity of the urine that you have there to decrease the irritation that's going on there. I'm glad that you guys love the thanks, Beth. <laughs> she loves the model, the model organ, right? So use that as a tool. Now also, when people have leakage, they tend to stop drinking water, right? Because they're like, oh my gosh, I'm leaking. Well, I'll just fix that problem by not drinking water. And eh, don't do that, okay? Because here's what happens. You're gonna become dehydrated, which causes a whole lot of issues in the body that tons of issues that we won't even go into. But also, you just have then made your urine more acidic. And that is going to tend to irritate the lining of the bladder. So that may actually cause the bladder to be irritated, to spasm, and leak more. So it's a balance. I want you to stay hydrated. And there is no real good science, real good evidence on exactly what the perfect amount of water is for everybody. But I tell people, ideally, take half your body weight. You know, Take your body weight, divide that by two. That's how many ounces of water you should drink throughout the day. And your urine should be a pale to kind of clear, you know, shouldn't have you having like bright, bright yellow urine that's like smelly, that's, that's toxic, you're, you're dehydrated. So drinking throughout the day and working with your pelvic floor PT, because they may have you do a bladder diary, they may have you start to chart how much fluid you're intaking. And when you go to the bathroom and you work with them to gradually space that out, to work with your, your lifestyle. There's some people that may have like an urge incontinence where they kind of feel that going on, like they have to go to the bath, bath, bathroom and then they leak or some people even like a situational thing. Like for some people, they may stick a key in a door, like when they get home and that may cause them to leak other people, you know, maybe it's a situation where they hear running water or something like that. This can all, um, it's different for everybody. So work with your pelvic floor PT. They're going to help you set up a bladder diary and start tracking those lifestyle things. And you can see kind of maybe what your trigger is and working on those things where maybe you do a couple contract relax when you get the urge and see if that calms it down for a little bit. And maybe you work on gradually spacing that out. We used to joke um, with pelvic floor PT that our goal was to be able to help patients watch Titanic because without having to get up to go to the bathroom, because it's a long movie, right? It's like four hours and there's a lot of water in that movie. So if you can make it through Titanic and, you know, ideally when we are going to the bathroom, I didn't talk about this, but if you're counting it out, start to count when you pee, when you're urinating. And by counting, I mean one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. If you don't get to eight Mississippis, you probably didn't have to go to the bathroom. Your bladder probably wasn't really full to go. So, so just notice that and kind of check in and start to track these little things and see where you're at. This is really important um, and helpful to have on hand to do with, with proper toileting techniques and checking into those things. So bladder irritants, be aware of them. Stay hydrated. You know, a lot of people tend to not drink water. Drink your water stay hydrated and work with your pelvic floor PT to really individualize a plan for you to work on helping you to space that out. I remember one of my sweet patients, she was having to go to the bathroom. She felt like all the time she was going to the, she said, I, I know all the bathrooms. She was trying to do um, car trips with her family and they had to like stop all the time for her. And we started treating her in the clinic and she got really, really great. And she came back with this big smile on her face and said, now when we go on a car trip, we have to stop for my husband <laughs> before we have to start for her. So it changed her whole quality of life, guys. And this is the, the joy of this work, working with people. And I'm not currently working in the clinic right now, but I provide, I do virtual health coaching and we do this education piece with people, right? And if they still need help, I help them find a pelvic floor PT in their area to get that one-on-one -on -one support because I feel like we can't replace that. You can't replace getting hands on you and evaluating and checking, checking the pelvic floor. But there's some people that just with bringing awareness and starting proper toileting techniques and being aware of their bladder irritants, a lot of stuff gets better. So see what works for you. This is really important. When do your, where urinary tract infections come into play? 
Yeah, so here's the thing with UTIs, and I will tell you a lot of that if we're looking at it from a functional perspective. I think diet and nutrition plays a lot into this, and we're going to talk about this. So it actually is a perfect segue into nutrition in the pelvic floor. Oh, Annette, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I love to spread awareness about pelvic health information. It's so important, and we just don't hear about it a lot, right? We're just not taught this stuff, unfortunately. So I love to kind of dive deeper into this. So let's talk about nutrition. And really, here's the thing, there can be food sensitivities that are causing inflammation because they can cause your immune system, which actually surrounds the digestive system, which we talked about, the digestive system, the urinary tract and system, like it's all directly linked in here in the pelvic floor, that can overreact. So we can get chronic inflammation that can show up as pain anywhere in the body. This can include your pelvis, this can include the hips, and oftentimes my clients that I see it's not just pelvic floor issues, right? It's also digestive issues like IBS or bloating or constipation. I love this guy. I got him out for this class or diarrhea or anything like that. In addition to the pelvic pain or the pelvic floor issues. So if your client or if you are not having normal bowel movements and they're having chronic constipation, no to the no, this is actually going to affect the muscles and the fascial support, your ligaments. So chronic constipation, it can cause stretching of the pedendal nerve because we get prolonged repetitive straining. That's why we don't wanna push or strain with that. This can lead to pelvic floor weakness or you know, secondary nerve damage. Constipation also creates more pressure on the bladder, on the urethra down here, and that can be problematic. So that can increase urinary frequency or retention. And constipation, chronic constipation can contribute to pelvic floor dysfunction and tightness in those pelvic floor muscles like we talked about going on. And this can affect your pelvis, your sacrum, right? That little triangle bone here in the back and the hips. It's all related. Everything is related to this right now, guys, because there's a lot happening in this area. So to get to the underlying root cause, I recommend, again, hydration, 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 optimal nutrition stress reduction techniques, deep breathing techniques, diaphragmatic breathing. Your pelvic floor PT will be looking at your diaphragm and how well you're breathing and doing those things to help you and even sleep, you know, optimizing sleep. So with UTIs, what I found from a functional nutrition standpoint, inflammatory foods are gluten, dairy, and sugar at a minimum. And guys, I went through when I got really sick, and this was actually before we found out about the cancer, but I started gaining weight and I was feeling really sick all of the time. And I was getting chronic urinary tract infections and yeast infections and bacterial vaginosis infections. Talk about not fun. I was in the doctor like every two weeks and it was, you know, then it was yeast and they were giving me diflucan and then it was, you know, bacterial vaginosis and they were giving me an antibiotic and then I had more yeast and it was this awful cycle. And when I changed my diet and I took out the gluten, the dairy and the sugar at a minimum, and I have a video that goes into this in more depth. So if you look me up on YouTube and you search nourishing from within, that's my basic, it's about 35 minutes, basic nutritional principles that will really help with that. And check that out. Or if you like to get nerdy like me, I have, I did a lecture on functional nutrition for the Doctor of Physical Therapy students at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. That one's very evidence-based, it's very research-based, and it's longer, it's like an hour and a half. But if you wanna look into that more to really dive into the nutrition piece, I feel like it's really important because when we're having you know, chronic urinary tract infections. And there are some things for that, some hygiene things, right? Like, please don't do um, like vaginal douches or, um, you know, cleanse, like soaps, like Summer's Eve or any of that. So please don't do that. Please don't do that. Your vagina is a self-cleaning oven. <laughs> she knows how to take care of herself. Water, water, okay? Like we don't need perfumes and soaps and all of this crazy stuff. No, no to the no on that, okay? So just like, water, maybe a little bit of gentle soap, like some Castile soap, but we don't need all of the synthetic fragrances. And this is where I feel like the essential oils come in so beautifully. You can make your own soap with just like a little bit of fractionated coconut oil and some Castile soap and some essential oils if you want it to smell better. Like leave all of those products off of that area and let that area go. After you have intercourse, you know, going to the bathroom, peeing after, that can help to reduce urinary tract infections. But especially if this is a pattern and you're seeing it often, that's kind of popping in here, 
look at letting go of some of the dairy and the gluten and the sugar. I will say for me, it was a game changer. I had very irregular periods, very painful periods, and just changing my diet and taking out the gluten, dairy, sugar for three months, my cycle is completely regulated. I have never had a urinary tract infection or yeast infection since then. It was an absolute game changer. So it starts from within, it starts with the gut health, and you can watch those videos to go even into more in depth with that. And then there are some essential oils that can support you, you know, if you're having discomfort or some issues with that, and we'll kind of jump into, but that's a good question. So for bladder support, say you're having to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom. And there's a couple things related to that. One, I think you need to stop fluids after 8 p.m. Because if you're drinking a bunch of water and then you go to bed, then yeah, we're gonna have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. But two essential oils that are my favorites, juniper berry and cypress. And I have a sweet friend, Dr. Brianne Grogan. I hope I'm saying your last name right, Brie. But Brie and I both found in our essential oil family and our essential oil community that this combo of juniper berry and cypress. So you can do, you could do a roller bottle maybe do like 10 to 15 drops of each in a little roller and top with a carrier oil and just roll that over the lower abdomen, right? Over the bladder area can be really nice. Or maybe you just do a couple drops of each and, you know, do a couple pumps of your fractionated coconut oil and just put that on before bed and put that over the bladder. That helps significantly. I cannot tell you how many of our oilers have noticed improvement with just cypress and juniper berry, whether that's, you know, you're struggling with leakage from time to time, or you're having to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. This is a really good combo. I would try it out. And I would love to do a behavioral research study on this. Maybe we should do it. We should take a poll, maybe in our all's well group and see if anybody would be open to trying it with us, but game changer for a lot of people. So juniper berry and cypress, very, very good to support you if and put it over the bladder as needed, especially before bed, especially if you're getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. Now, if we're talking about a pain situation, like where we've got some, I'm going to be as compliant as possible, some aches and discomfort in the bladder or pelvic area. So roll with me guys <laughs> as we go into code talk, but there's some really, really great ones. So actually geranium and lavender are very, very nice ones. And there's some interesting research about both of these oils for supporting the peritoneum and supporting like with any type of peritoneal trauma or anything like that. And I actually have, let me share my screen really quick. Now, please know when I'm talking about essential oils, especially when I'm talking about essential oils in such a sensitive area of the body, you really, really, these have to be a pure essential oil, guys. I'm not talking about oils from the health food store, no to the no, or the mall. I'm talking about a pure therapeutic grade oil, not a synthetic fragrance. You can tell if it's a synthetic fragrance. Well, unfortunately, it's hard to tell because there is no governing agency that's regulating this for us. So we have to be label reading gangsters, as my bestie Hillary would say, but this is an example why. This is 100% pure, right? Should be safe, should be great. Uh-oh, when we flip it over, it's orange and lemon. This is something that should be, if it's a pure oil, safe to ingest. But it says words like flammable and skin irritation and eye damage and allergic skin reaction, fatal if swallowed and enters airways. No to the no. Words like toxic. Do not ingest. This is a fake oil. This is really, really, really important, okay? Do not put this on your body. It's telling you not to put it topically. I would not even diffuse that because if it's saying toxic and all this stuff, this is a synthetic fragrance. This is a fake, fake oil. So the reason why I know, love, and trust doTERRA is you're going to see a supplement fact that these oils are safe for internal use. They are tested by third-party testers. The oils are sourced from where they are designed to thrive and grow. And one of my favorite resources that I'm gonna share with you guys really quickly is sourcetoyou.com. And you can go here to this website, and let me pull this up again. And it's really incredible. And you can read, if you're like me and you love the nerdy stuff, you can read all the nerdy stuff about the growers and the distilleries and the scientists. It's really beautiful. They work with the growers. They harvest the plants. The plants come from where they're designed to thrive. But you can also see quality reports. And I don't know any other company that has transparency in this way. So for example, you could type in, like all of the bottles of oil will have a code at the bottom. And I can type in, 
my bottle of frankincense. So let's just do this live. It's 173407A. And we will search for my bottle of frankincense. And this is the cool part, guys. This is the difference. If you don't know where your oils are coming from, if you can't see the chemistry, because an oil is only good as its chemistry, it's a FACO oil. So this was tested by a third-party lab, Aromatic Plant Research Center. And you can scroll down, and you can see the chromography, the testing here that has been done. And you can also see, oh, chromatomography. And then you can see here the chemical compounds and names. And then it says here, the analysis of this frankincense revealed no contaminants or adulteration. Very, very important, and I feel like I need to drive home that point. Please do not be putting fake oils from Walmart or the health food store or wherever and expect to get a therapeutic grade result with it. It is, it's just not, it's adulterated, there's solvents. Um, basically, I'm thinking of like you're putting toxins on your body and we're trying to reduce our toxic load. So please know that. And then when we're talking about a discomfort or an aches issue, I'm going to pull this up. This is actually a really cool recipe for support with pelvic aches or discomfort. This was given to me by my pelvic floor PT in Lubbock, Texas, Kathy Curry. She's amazing. She's a physical therapy today, and she's had lots of patients with pelvic aches and discomfort really respond well to this. And this is 10 drops each of, again, a pure, we're talking safer internal use, I trust and love doTERRA, lavender and geranium essential oil in a two ounce glass spray bottle. And I, you could use the droppers, you know, if you wanted and drop that on your finger and apply, or I like the spray. I feel like the spray is even easier. And I just got this little spray bottle from Share Oils. So you're going to start just 10 drops of each, and you're going to top with your carrier oil, with your fractionated coconut oil. And you can just apply it topically as needed to the vulva area for pain. You can also apply over the bladder and the lower abdomen. If it's too hot, if, if an oil is going to make it a little bit too hot or discomfort, dilute even more, or you can start with less geranium. Do eight drops of geranium, 15 drops of lavender, or you could always start with even less and work your way up. That's going to be really important. So experiment, make it your own. I believe in bioindividuality, but that has been a blend that has really, really helped a lot of Kathy's patients as well as mine. And I'll share some research about geranium and lavender specifically for pelvic floor coming up and kind of having that on hand. But that's a really good recipe. And then the other thing that you could do is take your peppermint oil. And if you were having a flare, maybe you were having an aches, discomfort flare, you can add a couple drops of peppermint into the toilet water. Now, peppermint's a hot oil. Do not put that on your vulvar tissue. No to the no. But drop the peppermint into your toilet and then just sit on top of the toilet. And it's very cooling and it can help you relax your pelvic floor. Maybe you just had a baby and that's a really sensitive area of the body. You could sit and do that and it could be really, really great to have that on hand. So Lindsay's asking, are PTs allowed to give these roller bottles to patients or could you just recommend it? Yeah, Lindsay, what I would do is just recommend it. And, you know, if you were comfortable with it, just kind of how we would refer out, right, as PTs, uh, refer them to me. I would love to help them and support them. Let them know, hey, I, one of my friends, she's an essential oil educator. She really has a, a specialty in pelvic floor and women's health and she would love to help you and I can teach them and educate them and help them get the oiler, oils and help them make their own rollers. That's what I do. And I think that would be a lot better way. Plus, let's get real. PTs, oh my gosh, they're working a lot. They have the documentation and the paperwork and all of that stuff. Um, you know, a lot of my, my sweet PTs, they're like, Laura, I don't have time to educate my people on essential oils. Send them to me. I would love to help and support them and give them that individual one-on-one -on -one support and attention and help them with that stuff. So lots of things, lots of ways that we can use our essential oils to support us and have those on hand. I love the essential oils. They're a tool, right? They're a tool. I feel like it, it's the lifestyle changes. It's the dietary changes. It's all of those things that are so important um, to have on hand. And there's a lot of oils with, with the pelvis. And again, for aches or discomfort, I also like Clary Calm. This is a really great blend. It helps with healthy estrogen and progesterone balance. So if you're having discomfort or aches around your cycle, you could use this daily for hormonal balances, or you could apply it when you're having cramps over the lower abdomen is needed, but it's got ylang-ylang and clary sage, and this helps to support adequate amounts of estrogen, which is really important. So even if you're in a postmenopausal situation, the ovaries 
maybe they're in retirement, but the adrenal gland should still be able to produce some amounts, small amounts of sex hormones, which is really important. So it's got Vitex oil, which is really nice to help balance progesterone. So this is what I love about the oils is they bring balance to the body. So this is a really nice one for stress because it's got Roman chamomile and geranium and lavender, things to kind of calm things down, but also to help support healthy hormone levels. And you could apply this daily, swipe along the panty line and also the inside of your ankle bones, those medial malleoli, just swipe, swipe, and you could do that every day and use it when needed for discomfort or anything like that. So those are kind of a few of my tips for essential oils supporting in this area. And then you also want to find a pelvic floor PT, right? So I'm going to share some links with you guys because that's so important. I can provide you with education, but nothing can really replace one-on-one -on -one, hands-on treatment with your pelvic floor physical therapist and really having them work with you. So I'm going to share my screen. There's two, there's two groups that you can actually look for. So one is Herman and Wallace. And I'll post this in our group, but this is their practitioner directory. And so you can search and find a pelvic floor PT in your area. And then also there's a PT locator with the section on women's health with the APTA. I believe they're actually changing their name soon. <laughs> so maybe just type in APTA pelvic floor, but right now this link is still working. So you can find that on hand and, and use that as needed. So this is very important. It helps you find a specialist in your area. Please remember that this is a specialty and it may take some time. You may be put on a wait list to see this person, but you could use the stuff that we're talking about in the meantime until you get in to see somebody. Yes. Oh, Lindsay. Yes, please do. Please tuck me into your pocket for future references. I would love to help and serve and support your patients and anybody that needs help. Okay, Pamela, are there oils you'd recommend to spray to keep things fresh down there. Okay. Honestly, you know, I think it's good to just let it air out or coconut oil, you know, coconut oil is great. It's antimicrobial. Um, you know, we kind of talked about lavender if you needed to for a little peritoneal support or geranium, but really just, just washing with a little bit of soap and water. Do not put soap inside the vagina or that area. Just, just water. Really. The vagina is a self cleaning oven. <laughs> just kind of let that go. Um, that's, that's really, really good too. Okay, Beth. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm so glad you're finding this helpful, Beth. It's my pleasure. Yes. I, Lindsay, I did my training actually through Herman and Wallace. Loved it. Took several of the Herman and Wallace uh, courses. Kathy and Holly Herman, they're awesome. Lynn, they have a great staff, great faculty there. Oh, so you're saying, Michelle, did you, did you say you use um, Melaleuca diluted? Here, let me unmute you. <laughs> no problem. I use the Melaleuca diluted with a fractionated coconut oil and I just rub that on my inner thighs um, in my work I'm very very active and I sweat like a man so <laughs> I need a little extra support to keep the buggies away so I just yeah rub and just on the inner thighs not anywhere down there but it still yeah. helps me anyway feel better oh that's a great one because mm -hmm. melaleuca is really great for uh, so many things it works it's really great like a cleansing great great oil great oil to have so that is awesome. Yes, yes, yes. And then for those of you, if, um, so find a pelvic floor PT. We'll post those there. Again, this is my big, my big message to all of you. Urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, leakage, low back pain, hip pain, SI pain. If it's not improving with traditional therapy, if you have pain with tampons, if you have pain with pelvic exams or intercourse or organ prolapse, or you feel like something's fallen out, or you feel like you can't fully empty your bladder or empty your bowels when you have a bowel movement, please, please, please go see a pelvic floor PT. They are amazing. They will help you. They will change your quality of life in so many ways. If you are new to essential oils, I would love to help and support you. And, and help you. And actually, this is a really cool month to get started. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys again. If you're new and you are open to learning a little bit more about all of this, September is an awesome month. And we just touched basic stuff, right? Just a little bit in the beginning of this class because our hour is almost up. So much to talk about. And I'll, I'll save room for questions too if, if anybody wants to stay a little bit longer. But just this month, there is an amazing kit and it's our top 10 oils. And it, we talked about lavender a lot. Frankincense is another one that's really great. Um, but so many of these to help with everything from discomfort, aches and discomfort, to you know, seasonal threats or the stuffy nose or anything like that, to supporting your immune system as we go into falling cold and or 
So we go into winter and fall, got to be compliant, winter and fall. <laughs> you know, all of these things, if you have head tension, neck tension, focus, sleep support, these oils will help you. I would love to help and support you. This kit is regularly, so retail it's 366.67. It's regularly 275 wholesale and it's on sale just this month for 220. And I have been with doTERRA since 2014. This is the lowest I have ever seen it go, ever. So if you were following me for a while, if you're kind of curious about oils, there's actually a lot of research about essential oils. I love getting nerdy with the research. Now's the time, please reach out to me. I would love to help and support you and get you going with this because this, is, this literally is the lowest price of the entire year. I've only seen it offered one other time. So now's the time to get going. And then here's a couple of my resources too. If you're new to following, this is my website. So I provide virtual health coaching, which is really awesome. And I work with people. I provide the education piece. Again, I don't actually do the treatment right now, but the education piece, you can email me if you've got questions. You can follow me on Facebook. And please like the page. Um, you will see when we do more classes and information. As you guys can see, I get really passionate. I love to educate and support and teach. This is our Facebook group. If you're watching on Zoom, you can hop over there to also catch the replay. I'm on all the things. You can follow me on Instagram, Periscope, Pinterest. I'm on YouTube. There's going to be lots of awesome stuff there. So you can screenshot that if you want to follow me or find me in those areas. But yeah, now is the time. If you guys want to get started with oils, this is a really, really great time to do so and have that on hand. So I missed a couple of the questions. Oh, thanks so much, Ileana. It's so good to see you. You know what? Yes. So what I'm going to do, this video will be up just for a couple weeks here in our learning with Dr. Laura group. We also have the essential oils in the brain class replay, and these will be up through the end of this month. So you can add people into this group. They can watch the replay as much as possible, but my hope is to also upload it to my YouTube and you could share it from there. Um, to help people too. So let me know. And also Ileana, you're one of my Oilers. So we have a whole, all of the classes that I teach are up in our private Facebook group. And that's the other thing. When you get started with me, I'm going to get you an amazing welcome packet with goodies. We're going to set up a time to teach you one-on-one -on -one how to use your oils and get you supported and also plug you into our private Facebook group for continued education. I promise these oils are not going to sit on a shelf. We're going to empower you and you're going to feel really comfortable using these uh, natural tools, natural remedies, integrative health, right? Oh, so Crystal's asking, so the TTU HSC lecture, actually guys, let me share my screen and I'll just show you guys really quick how simple it is to find. So if you go over to good old YouTube and if you search my name, so just hop over to YouTube and search Dr. Laura Ritchie Functional Nutrition and search there this will pop right up. So here it is. First one here, this functional nutrition lecture for the, for the doctor PT students. So that's right there. And then you can also look up if you want a more condensed version of like, how do I just get started uh, nourishing from within search my name and nourishing from within. And here it is. This is the talk that I did for the Laura Bush Institute. Women's Health Lunch and Learn. And this one's a little bit more condensed and you can kind of have it there. If you want one-on-one -on -one individualized support and help, let me know. That's what I do in my virtual health coaching practice. Or again, if you'd love support with the essential oils, please let me know. I would love to help you. If you found out about this class through Michelle, reach out to Michelle because she is amazing and she's going to help you and support you and plug you in. We're all part of the same oils family. If you found out about this class and this information from me, reach out to me and I would love to help and support you. Uh, type in any questions that you've got, guys. I'll, we'll hang out for, you know, maybe five, ten more minutes to answer any questions that you have. Uh, if you need to jump off, thanks for being here. Thanks for catching the replay. Michelle, did I miss anything? Do you anything you want to add? Um, just a couple little notes. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that finding a pelvic floor PT is huge. And um, like I said before, can really help when you find some of the root causes and you work through that can really affect your life in a major way because your quality of life improves. So it may be a little scary and it may be hard to advocate for yourself, but I would just say be strong and just be encouraged. There are other women who have these sorts of issues. So um, there's a lot of help out there, but we just need to know where to go. For me, it was about 12 years, 11 years that I struggled and 
you know, I had, you know, just, just more KY or more foreplay or whatever, you know, until I finally found an amazing women's health, uh, a PT for pelvic floor. So that was great. And shortly right after that, we got pregnant. So it was just a really huge blessing. And then my current PT, because now, you know, that I've had two kids, things look a little bit different and feel a little bit different. So she's helping me with some similar issues that I had before and some new issues. So um, that was really great. She helps me journal and recommended the journaling. And that's when I realized I wasn't really as far bad off as I thought, but I recognized some of it was like um, some bladder irritants because I could go through the movie Titanic. I could do that, <laughs> but uh, not if I were eating the wrong things, even things like tomatoes. Most people mm. don't realize, you know, um, and you have to watch really carefully because even MSG is hidden. There's 40 different forms or more of MSG and it can be really sneaky because they're trying to find ways to sneak it in there, but that's also an irritant. Um, citrus, things that I never really considered so um of course chocolate that's going to stay in my life i'm convinced that's the first thing that'll anyway i gotta live with chocolate i can't give that up um and then i wanted to ask you about bladder irritants because i've read a little bit about cranberry so what are your thoughts on cranberry um is what have you heard or seen or experienced and what's your recommendation because some people swear by it and i don't know yeah, that's a good question. And I think it depends on the person, to be honest. I'm finding more and more in the work that we do, it's really bio-individualized. Mm -hmm. And it depends. Like, we often hear cranberry, like even doing cranberry supplements for things like cranberry tract infection or, you know, issues. And it just kind of depends with what's going on. So it may be to where that could be helpful. You know, with, the, like, the citrus. Like, I work a lot with um, interstitial cystitis clients, health coaching clients, and citrus may really be hard on some of them and others not. So I find what's really helpful, you know, try it, really get in tune with your body, see how it's working for you. And see, like if we're doing a cranberry juice, that could be really high in sugar, which could be, you know, kind of uh, counter counterintuitive, counter helpful for us there too. So I really like people to kind of check, see what's feeling best for them and works for them and kind of go from there. That's a good question, Michelle. Uh oh, we lost Michelle on video. Um, okay. Any other questions that you guys can think of? Oh, thank you so much, Ileana. Yes, I will definitely let you know. I would love to share. That would be amazing. Pebby missed. Um, yeah. So for, for any type of leakage, we really like Cypress and Juniper Berry and doing a couple drops of each on, you know, if you do a couple drops of each, a little bit of carrier oil, rub that on your lower abdomen over the bladder, or you could make a roller with like 10 to 15 drops of each and apply that too. And it works really, really well. And geranium and lavender are really awesome. Yes. Yes. That would be amazing too. Several. There's so many, there's so many awesome things. That's what I love about the essential oils is they're very safe. You can utilize them with the things that you're already doing and it gets rid of the synthetic fragrances and stuff like that. Oh, I'm so glad Marisol. I'm so glad that you learned a lot from the class. Okay, I'll open it up for a couple more questions. We'll kind of hang out. Let's hang out for a couple more minutes and see if you have questions or if not, we'll pop off and we'll let you guys get back to your evening. Thank you guys so much for being here. Always is such a joy and a, a privilege to be on here with you. And I, I want a special thanks to Michelle. Thank you, Michelle, for this class because it was really her idea. It was her inspiration. She said, hey, I would love to you know, do a class about women's health and pelvic floor and bring you on and talk. What do you think? And this is a topic that I'm so passionate about. And I'm always excited anytime that I can bring out Bertha and bring out my little poop emoticon <laughs> stuffed animal is a good day in my book. And this is something that a lot of women need, right? And discussing things that are really, really important for our overall health. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Crystal, for watching over on Zoom. And yeah. Okay. Well, there's not any other questions coming on. So I'll let you guys get back to your evening. Thank you for being here. The replay will be up in the learning with Dr. Laura group. So make sure that you tell your friends, invite them over, would love to share and support and, and have that on hand and can be really helpful. So Ileana is saying for interstitial cystitis patients, cranberry is usually a big no, no and can make symptoms worse. And for some reason, it's actually not letting me pull up. Looks like you said more Ileana, but for some reason I can't open it to see, to see more. Let me see. Oh, it's not letting me. I'm so sorry. 
with the chat. I'll have to go back and read it and I'll comment on there too. My pleasure, Pamela. My pleasure, Ruth. Yes, can be super helpful. And I'm, I really recommend in bio-individuality, guys. That's really, really important. Tune in, trust your body, see what works. If anything makes your symptoms worse, stop. As we talked about, it's really, really important. Okay, well, you guys have a wonderful rest of your evening and we will talk to you later. Bye.